For at least 25 years now, you and I have been fed the following line. This car invented the hot hatch. A fact I would not argue with in any way, shape, or form. Yet, there's another distinction this car holds that's slightly more nuanced, and that is, this was the mid-70s to mid-80s reinterpretation of the Volkswagen, wait for it, Carmen Ghia. Today, I'm going to explain why that statement is not bullshit. The first stop in any discussion involving a GTI, especially a Mark I, would be what makes it go. In this case, a 1.8 liter four-cylinder engine driving the front wheels through a five-speed manual transmission. Think back to 1976 when this car first came out in Europe and 1983 when this car first came out in the US. That was otherworldly technology, at least to be fitted as standard. Most other cars had four-speed manual transmissions. Then when we dig a bit further, that's where we get into some very period technology, like eight valves. In terms of translating that to output, 90 horsepower. Yes, this car was fuel injected, and yes, there was a version in Europe that had 110 horsepower from the same engine. Now, while you're picking yourself up from the floor laughing, remember this. There were other Rabbits or Golfs that were on offer that weren't GTIs. Like there was a 1.7 liter four that can be had with a four-speed manual transmission that was all of 65 horsepower. And then there was a 1.7 with a five-speed manual that was 74 horsepower. Uh, then if that was too slow for you, there was something else. There was a 1.6 diesel that had all of 52 horsepower. So now you can understand why this was the fire-breathing monster of the day. In terms of torque, it was 100 pound-feet. Now I did have to do some digging to understand one of the benefits of this whole equation, and that was fuel economy. And I found this amazing resource of the original brochure of this car from back in the day, from 1984 and they claimed the fuel economy to be 26 in the city in 1984 and 36 on the highway. Like that's close to a Prius today. It kind of gives you an idea of how far ahead these guys were. Then performance figures. Here, zero to 60, 9.7 seconds. Now before you laugh, a Camaro with a V8 around the same time was about the same to 60. Then there's VMAX, 106 miles an hour. One of the benefits of going back in time is also going back in weight. 2011, no, that is not kilograms, that is pounds. Depending on how you express your weights and measures in kilograms, 912. Put another way, that is about half the weight of a current 911 turbo. Uh, with that, here we go. Oh yes. Ah uh, yeah, uh, about 3,000 RPM. You get all of that 100 pounds of torque. And you know what, it ain't bad considering the vintage of this car. Actually, this thing's kind of fun. It's not fast. I would not call this thing fast. And um, just as an aside here, I love you guys, and here's proof as to how I love you guys. It is about 90 degrees today, so my air conditioning is not here. There is no air conditioning in this car. This is my air conditioning. This little slit up here is my air conditioning. Even if this car were fitted with air conditioning, there is not a center vent in this thing. Anyway, back to the transmission, I have to say it's close ratio, at least as an approximation of close ratio back in the day. It's longer throws, but the gears are not well spread apart. So it's really good for up here. It's not great for driving it around town. It's happy between, I'd say 3,000 and 4,000 RPM. It starts to get wheezy around 5,000 RPM. The sprightly acceleration aside, the thing that really stands out here would be the driving dynamics. Now in 2021, you're saying, well, that's a Volkswagen. Volkswagens, they usually drive better. But here's the thing. This is the car that made you think that. Uh, and it's not because it has exotic materials. This was based on the 1974 Golf or Rabbit in the US that was designed by Jagaro to be the replacement to the Beetle and to be the car that was efficient, that was the new modern day people's car. 
As such, up front it was a McPherson struts, in the rear it had a torsion beam. But here they made a couple of changes. It's coil springs all the way around, and they have a 16.5 millimeter anti-roll bar in the front, 20.5 millimeter anti-roll bar in the rear. To give you an idea of basis comparison, some of like the Hyundais that we drive, the sports, that kind of stuff, today they have 20.5 millimeter anti-roll bars in the back. Then we get into the whole setup of the car, and really the secret is the weight. That also helps with the driving dynamics. Like I'm pushing this thing pretty hard, but for a car that has a 0.42 coefficient of drag, again, as a basis of comparison, Volvo station wagons back in the day, 1984 Volvo 700 series station wagons had coefficient of drag of like 0.35 or 0.36. So better than this sort of economy sporty hatch. To give you an idea, this is two inches shorter in wheelbase than a modern day 911. So it's not exactly a short car, but it's not big by any stretch of the imagination. Most Honda Accords would absolutely dwarf this thing today. It's kind of like a thoroughbred. The faster you push it, the better the ride quality is. And that could be a function of the 14 inch wheels. They kind of skip along joints in the freeway. And then there's the steering. And here, there's good news and there's bad news. I would say it is direct, more direct than most cars of its day, because there's definitely a lot of firefighting moving going on here. But <laughs> I wouldn't say it's precise. Uh, like for example, push it around these roads, or more importantly, push it on a freeway, even around a turn on a freeway. And if there's a bump or any imperfection in the road, uh, the car, it approximates where the steering left off. It kind of picks up the front end of the car, remember, because it's so light, and it puts itself somewhere else on the road. And that brings us to the braking and yet another surprise. Because like everything else underneath this vehicle, it's not exotic hardware. Up front, yes, there are discs, 9.4 inch diameter rotors. In the rear, it's drums, 7.1 inch drums. Now usually when you and I drive classic cars with drums, and we push these things aggressively, what happens is either there's no stopping power or there's too much stopping power in the front of the car and no stopping power in the rear of the car. You don't get that here. That's something I find fascinating. It's more, it's like balanced braking and you get some control over the vehicle. Like dare I say you can do some trail braking through turns here with drums in the back. And I would not be doing my job if I didn't mention a rather important contributor to the driving dynamics of this specific Mark 1 GTI, and that would be the mileage. This only has 61,573 miles as I drive here. No, it is not that time to play your favorite game of mine, the options game. Rather, it's time to play our newest game, Options Game Senior. That's the game where we go through the prices of these cars when they were new and compare them to what they're worth today, as stated by our good friend Dave Kinney, who literally writes the book on classic car values. And this one is pretty important. It is the car that launched an entire genre. This one, the 1984 Volkswagen Rabbit GTI in Europe. It was the Golf GTI in Europe. It came out in 1976. And just as an aside, the Golf itself with the Jaguar design came out in 1974. In the US, the GTI came out in 1983. And new, it was $7,990. There are not many options fitted to this car, although there are some options. I do not know what the price of the individual options are because the only thing I could find was the base price. But I can tell you the vent windows are optional. The gauges in the center console, those were optional. The sunroof, my favorite option, and frankly for a car that does not have the optional air conditioning, very important. But we need to press on to what Dave says now. He calls this at a condition four for $4,500. But if it were a condition three, it would be $9,400. If it were a condition two, $12,400 or a condition one. That's like a Concorde quality car you would take to Pebble Beach, which at some point, I would not be surprised if we see these at Pebble Beach, $20,400. Now let's look back here. The original price of the car was just under $8,000 in 1984. What is that in $2,021? Well, that's $20,544. Okay, so that's all fine and good, but what does that mean against the current pricing 
of the new GTI that we just drove, which we're kind of guesstimating at $32,500. Well, if we take $20,544 and subtract that from $32,500, which I'm thinking is going to be the base price of that car, that is a 58% increase in base price. But Dave has some interesting things to say here. These are absolutely collectible. And as they get older, the delta between the condition four cars and the condition one cars will be much larger. Like for example, it's only about $15,000 today, but these, these were driven hard and put away wet. Yeah, they made 35,000 of them over 1983 and 1984 model years, but very few of them exist like this one. This one, I want to call a condition three. It's a survivor. The paint, it's got a hell of a lot of scratches in it. That exhaust is incredibly annoying. It's not perfect. The interior has been refinished, but it's still, it, you got to give some points for the fact that it's a GTI in this condition. So I'm going to call this a very low two, like a two minus. And my guess is this thing would be about 12,000, maybe $13,000 in value. So I'm coming to you from a future episode to see if you finally figured out what the hell I meant by the Mark I GTI is really the spiritual successor of the Carmen Ghia. By now you probably have given up, so I'll just answer it for you. Think about what the Carmen Ghia was back in the day. It was a gussied up Volkswagen Beetle, meaning everything underneath was the same. They just changed the body to make it look different to have a different equation. The GTI is exactly the same, they just change the equation. Everything on the top still looks the same, everything on the bottom is pretty much the same, they just tuned it differently, but they have, like in the Carmen Ghia, completely given you a totally different equation. So judging by the fact that I do not look as fresh as when we started this episode, probably a good time to talk about usability of this thing, maybe not as a daily, but as an occasional daily, because someone could get away with that with a Mark I GTI. You know, Volkswagens, if I'm honest today, they are not the pinnacle of reliability because they've gotten very complex. Really all German cars, it's not just a knock on Volkswagen. This was from a time when these things were ridiculously reliable. So this is the kind of car that, yeah, it's a classic. It's highly uncomfortable without the air conditioning, as you can see by my glowing face. But you could use it every day and it would not cost a lot to keep it on the road in terms of maintenance and obviously through insurance. Now something huge to point out that Dave shared in his latest book, there is a sizable delta between the Mark I GTIs and Mark II GTIs. The reality is they are not coveted on the classic car market. They're like half the value of these things at best. And from what I understand from Dave, that will continue to trend the same way as future values increase on these things, probably more of a delta. Then something we've got to point out is that sunroof. Now, yeah, you guys know I'm a huge sucker for sunroofs, and I would absolutely need a sunroof in my Mark I GTI, but Dave has noticed a trend as of late. With all these folks moving to cars that they can take on tracks or take on autocross days, that kind of stuff, people put it in their head like, oh no, I don't want the sunroof, I want the stronger structural vehicle, so I definitely don't need a hole in my roof. Now, here's the reality of the situation. A 2,000 pound car meant to be an Econobox daily back in the mid 70s to the early 80s, you're not gonna see a huge difference in the structural rigidity of a car with or without a sunroof. I would argue the same thing with modern day performance cars. You're really not gonna see a huge difference, at least if you are not drawing a paycheck as a pilot of an F1 car. That's the only example of, okay, don't get the sun. But it's a trend nonetheless, and it's like perception is reality. And what Dave is seeing, people are going to start paying up for cars without the sun. I think it's stupid. I think you pay extra for the car with a sunroof because it makes the car more usable. And the reality is how many times is someone that's gonna baby a car like this gonna push it hard on a track or an autocross to the point where you would give up the usability? You know what, on second thought, go ahead, pay extra for the cars with a slick top. Because that would leave an opportunity 
for folks like myself that realize the better car is the one with the sunroof, and thus we would pay less. So uh, you know what I gotta say here is, feeling done. Now before we part ways for the day, you and I need to discuss the rather important business of the history of this specific car, which is unique when you consider the original mission of GTIs. A daily driver you could have fun with on the weekends. They were never intended to survive 37 years later and be a bona fide classic like this one is. So when you look at it in that light, a car that is a survivor, this car is not restored and it has 60,000 original miles Yes, the interior has been reupholstered, but reupholstered as the car was originally born. Now, this car is indeed part of the Volkswagen North America Heritage Collection, and I've had the opportunity to drive this car now in three different states. I drove it in Chattanooga. I drove it in San Francisco at the launch of the last generation, meaning two generations ago, GTI. And then obviously they've been kind enough to ship it out here so Kumo and I could drive it on our home turf. But prior to that, it has had three separate owners. It was originally born in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Well, actually it was born in Westmoreland, Pennsylvania, but it was delivered new to Kalamazoo, Michigan. Kind of behind enemy lines, especially in the mid eighties, when you consider that car was imported or sort of imported. And I have to say the original owners did take very good care of this car because it has all of the stamps in the factory service booklet all the way through to 60,000 miles. And then on top of the stamps in the book, it also comes with a stack of receipts for all the maintenance that's been done over the years. Like for example, I have some of the receipts from Kazoo Motors, which was or currently is a Volkswagen, Volvo, Porsche, Audi dealer in Kalamazoo, Michigan. The oil changes back in the day in 1985 for this car cost $9.60. And this is the point of the episode where I turn this around to you guys to opine in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV on Word, Moto Man TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And with that, I have to say this was super fun driving a classic on the show again. I have shared with you guys in the past. It's very tough for us to do classic car episodes because very few of you guys watch these episodes. So what we're gonna ask here is please click like, really helps with the algorithm, leave a comment, and most importantly, share these episodes with your friends on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and most importantly, Reddit, because that's what gets us the most lift. And if we see these episodes shared, we can do more classic car episodes. And to give you some incentive, the folks at Volkswagen alone, they have a beautiful, like, perfect condition, perfectly restored Samba bus. They've got a thing, and they've got practically every Beetle under the sun. So I'd love to shoot those, as well as some wonderful classics from Mercedes, Porsche, and BMW's got a great collection in South Carolina that they've offered. So let's just say, let's start sharing these episodes and click like and do all that kind of stuff. I hate pandering about this kind of stuff in these episodes, but that's what I gotta do so we can do some unique things and get away from driving baby buggies. Until I see you in the next episode, bish beta.